Welcome back to Of Cryptids and Creatures, the show where I, a very tired college artist, attempts to draw something in about an hour and condense it into about eight minutes so I can tell you about various cryptids and creatures from our own lore and mythology in the real world to Dungeons and Dragons. This week we're back at it again with our Dungeons and Dragons lore, and we'll be talking about a very interesting uh, species this week, the Flail Snail. Now don't be put off by what you know about actual snails in the real world and the size of this drawing, because flail snails, according to 5e, are size large creatures and are about 8 feet tall. Size large usually means in terms of the game that it fits in a 10 by 10 square for combat, so this is a fairly large creature. You may be wondering what are the defining features of the flail snail. Well, the flail snail has about four to six flails, usually about five atop of its head that it uses for attack and defense, and an incredible anti-magic shell. Now, this is the thing that makes them valuable to those who would hunt it, because the flail snail has magical properties that can allow it to resist magic and therefore make very powerful magic items out of it. In fact, when attacking the flail snail with a magic uh, spell or effect, there's an 80% chance that it just produces a random effect instead of actually targeting the snail, meaning that it could entirely miss, it could fail and nothing happens, or it can actually be redirected to hit you if you targeted it. On top of this, the flail snail actually has a fairly high AC coming in at about 18, and it does have the ability to completely retract itself into its shell, and while it can't attack in this state, that adds about an extra 6 to its armor class, making it even harder to hit if it doesn't want to fight you. And like the myconids from earlier in the series, these are fairly pacifistic creatures in nature who will only attack if provoked. And let's not forget the one thing that it does have in common with its real world compatriot actual snails. These things are incredibly slow. I mean, obviously faster than a real snail, but that's mostly due to size. That's about it. In terms of combat, the flail snail does use its flails for combat, and those flails can be disarmed uh, and, and crushed, but they will grow back after a certain amount of days. This isn't lethal to the snail, but it will make it definitely harder for it to hit you back in a fight. Now you may be wondering, what would possibly inspire some monster like this in D&D? Well, it could possibly be part of a trope that dates back to the 13th and 14th century in Europe. Um, if you look at a lot of paintings from there, there's several of them where knights are just fighting giant snails. So maybe that's part of the reason that we have something such as the flail snail. Though I will say some of those images of knights back then fighting snails aren't really as scary as what a flail snail might be. Now, flail snails were added to 5th edition with the addition of Volo's Guide to Monsters, where it had its own page for the first time, and it's described as an elemental creature of earth, and it actually eats some soil and rocks and sand to reflect that now where it didn't previously. Also something about the flail snail that is emphasized more than it was in previous editions is its use for being hunted for parts. Like I mentioned, it has that anti-magic shell, which hunters seem to be particular in, particularly interested in when it comes to making magic items for your next adventuring party, but also these guys leave a trail of glass behind them that is used for windows and other glass objects. So these guys are actually full of useful parts. It's a shame they're hunted for them though. 
Speaking of Volo's Guide to Monsters, the coloring palette that I kind of used for the Flail Snail is inspired off of the image that appears in its 2016 version, which has this beautiful twisting like blues and purples uh, for the shell and more of a red into orange into brown for the rest of the body though I did take some liberties and it definitely is a little more bright than flail snail may actually appear. It is a shame that I couldn't really figure out how to make the shell seem shiny and magical. The most I kind of did was go in and add more twisting and strange kind of shading for purples and other blues that kind of went with that green uh, and went in and started kind of highlighting them a little bit like I do in every single video. If you couldn't tell, I kind of have a process at this point. Something else that I kind of also struggled with was, uh, you see right now I'm kind of making those dots uh, that cover the snail, um, and now I'm tracing back over them. I originally wanted them to be entirely white, but to me I could still see the black lines underneath them from having traced them out previously, so I think if I were to go back I wouldn't trace them out like that and then I would just make them white so when I come back into line I kind of line all of them once more uh, and here I am going back in like I usually do and um, making those thick lines so it kind of pops out against the background a little bit and it gives it a little more depth and pop from that like entirely white page that I'm on but I was excited to play with some more gradients and warmer colors because a lot of this series so far I've kind of leaned into those blues and purples and I kind of only touched on that with the shell and then I had a little more fun with that gradient from that red into that yellow into like that brown color um, and I had a lot of fun with this piece uh, and there I am just kind of lining a little slimy trail and this is the flail snail from Dungeons and Dragons. I hope you all enjoyed. I've had a lot of fun with this series and I'm excited to see what uh, I come up with next and get to talk to you guys about. As always, this has been Of Cryptids and Creatures. I'm Royal Spook. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.